I guess I should unmute there for the beginning, but uh, welcome everybody to another episode of Office Hours where we'll be discussing uh, all things Microsoft 365 and answering questions from the community. Uh, my name is Christian Buckley. I'm an Office Apps and Services uh, MVP and a Microsoft Regional Director, and I'm on the Microsoft Go-To-Market Director at AvPoint. And joining me today, and I'm going to try and go by order of the having joined this, uh, but we have... Uh, so Neil Hodgkinson was first to the lineup here, but dialing in all the way from Cancun, it's rough to be on, to, to be Neil today, uh, this week or the next two weeks. What on uh, earth is he doing here? Yeah. And then we have Mike Nelson, a solution architect at, P at Pure Storage and a cloud and data center and management MVP based in Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, we also have Hal Hostetler, a senior field engineer with Roland Shore and Tower in Tucson, Arizona, and an Office Apps and Services MVP. Uh, we were then joined to think of the order. Yeah, Sherry, then a Microsoft certified trainer, Microsoft Office Master, and co-founder for Power Up Learning in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And then we had Sean McDonough joining, uh, joining us. He's a consultant with Bitstream Foundry in Cincinnati, Ohio, and an Office Apps and Services MVP. I had like a breath mint uh, 20 minutes ago. I'm still salivating too much, so apologize for that, <laughs> that stumble. We might have uh, Eric Riz and or Mark Rackley join us later. I think Sharon's uh, out. I'm not sure if Tracy's going to make it, but we'll we'll move forward. We'll do our best. How's everybody doing? Yeah, it's, it's Monday. I was doing better on Friday. <laughs> it's it's always Monday when we connect and talk and do this. Okay. Uh, yeah, I suppose so. Had a, had a great weekend. I could relax in Cancun, but now I'm working in Cancun for a week. Well, probably till Friday morning. The life of a got... Microsoft consultant. Yeah. I'm not a consultant. Never been You're a an consultant internal in consultant, life. Neil. The People life of a Microsoft answers. employee. Change, but find a scene. What's what's a good scene for? So I kind of like the the space, the UNSC. There we go. Do you know why you're working in Cancun, Neil? Because you can. <laughs> Sorry, say again, Sherry. Why are you working in Cancun? Because you can. Because I can. Because you yeah. can. It was actually right? cheaper to book two weeks in the vacation resort than it was to book one. Oh, wow. So I thought, okay, that works. It's a discount with our travel club thing. So, so if you increase the amount of time that you're in Cancun, does it get cheaper and cheaper till, till eventually they're paying <laughs> till you to live is, is that how it works? <laughs> paying to fly Neil. I can ask. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just if you question. stay for four weeks, will it be half the cost? Just to ask that. Is that homework? Question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anything else going on this week? Anything else exciting happening? No, you just had no. RD get over with it last week, didn't you? That's right. So I had the uh, MVP Summit two weeks ago, RD Summit last week. And uh, yeah, some really good sessions. Uh, there were... Uh, you know, a number that were duplicates of the MVP summit, but the ones especially that were uh, RD led on kind of special topics. I mean, it's just always fantastic. We had a great session. Obviously, I can't get into details of any of the stuff that we went through, but um, there were good sessions at both events um, uh, around community development, community building and support for uh, conferences and and webinars and hybrid events and that kind of stuff. So uh, it's always it's always great to hear from other experts out in the field. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how everyone else is, but you know, since 
a lot of conferences have gone virtual. I find it very hard to a lot time and stick to it to catch conference sessions. Yeah. I mean, I've got like high priority client work and it just trumps things and I can't, you know, that physical act of going to a location actually got me enough distance both mentally and physically that I could focus on the conference, but I can't seem to do that anymore. Yeah, I would agree yeah. with that. And one of the points that came up, uh, we were having a discussion just about this last week, uh, because a conference that we're actually uh, putting on, um, you know, was like <clears throat> going, you know, virtual and folks were like, uh, it's not the same, you know, um, it's really hard to, to be able to do this, you know, for three days straight. Yeah. So we're splitting it up over, you know, three or four hours per day. Um, but it's going to stretch over two weeks rather than just, you know, and <clears throat> to be honest, uh, I got asked to do a, a session for, uh, there's a PowerShell, um, the PowerShell summit. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a big thing that happens every year. Sounds uh, cool. Yeah. It's, it's actually a replacement for Microsoft used to have it. Now a group runs it out of uh, Minnesota. Um, but the PowerShell and DevOps summit. And the thing about it was, is that they're, the conversation was around, uh, they're actually, they're charging, you know, they're charging. Yeah. So to register, it's a, uh, it's a fee. And my question was, is it's gotten to a point now where, you know, uh, for a virtual event, you're charging people for the, uh, rights to view your content after the fact. And I said, you know, a, a quote on Twitter came out and said, it's pretty much just like Netflix. So virtual conferences are turning into Netflix um, that you're paying ahead of time to be able to watch the content after, uh, you know, and, and to me, that makes very little sense in my mind. It, it just is. Um, otherwise, what what are you paying for? What I mean, there's no there's no special access. There's no there's no, you know, uh, events like live music and places, you know, all the stuff that you get when you're an in-person event. And no swag. Point. Yeah. No yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pay per view power show. Exactly. Exactly. So I, I, I'm trying to understand the justification for, for charging for something like that. And, and so far, everybody I've talked to, they really haven't given me any valid reasoning. I mean, it's not to me, it's not valid. I hear you, Mike. I don't know if anybody else has any opinions on that, but it just it was it got to an actual argument. <laughs> so um, it was quite, quite interesting. Well, um, Mike, do you want to uh, take us through? Do you have any uh, community center updates that you'd like to discuss? Do, okay. We don't want Christian doing it again. <laughs> yeah. How did, that go? That was How did that go, by the way? It went beautifully, Mike. <laughs> it went over yeah, like a lead pipe, Mike. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> All I right. Have a couple of garlic necklaces if anybody needs one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, I'm back. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about SharePoint, first of all, uh, my favorite topic, not. Um, and the thing about it is that they've come out with SharePoint release uh, that will give scenario-based site templates. So this is really cool because one of the things I've always fought with is when I go into SharePoint and I want to create a site and I'm like, I'm really stupid at SharePoint and I'm really stupid at creating really cool sites in SharePoint, you usually have to end up paying, you know, really, 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 really smart people like Sherry and Sean a lot of money to create a really cool site for you. Um, and I'm just giving them a hard time. I don't mean that. But uh, now they've actually come out with just, you know, a whole bunch of other sites. So communication site templates. You can go department, leadership connections, learning central, which I think will be a big hit because a lot of folks use SharePoint for the learning aspect. Um, Employee onboarding, you know, uh, uh, showcase, spotlight, you know, an event. So if you have an event, you could you could spotlight it. Otherwise, people were just using the, the basic, I think it was a, a, a blank or something or a basic or a team site. Team and then site, they'd have yeah. To, yeah, then they'd have to take and take widgets out and, or uh, uh, the web parts out and they'd have to move things around and all that other kind of stuff. Um, they've also created team site templates, you know, for event planning. Uh, I think they've always had a project management one, but they say project management here. Uh, training and courses, training and development. 
and team collaboration. So I think this is kind of big, uh, especially for folks that are just trying to create a, a cool site that matches what they're trying to do. And I think it took a little bit too long for Microsoft to come out with this, but uh, I think it's good. So well, I, the one question I have <laughs> is, how's it different than the Fab 40? Then the fat, what is the, I don't know what the fab, oh, oh, uh, the oh. fab 40 flashback. <laughs> Microsoft came out with, um, 40, uh, combination of site templates, add-ins, things like that, that gave you many pre-canned functions on top of SharePoint. So like project management, uh, expense tracking, all sorts of things like that. The only problem became when somebody went to upgrade, the Fab 40 did not upgrade, or at least ah. you'd need to do a lot of work with it. So it's too kind much of scripting. There was too much scripting behind the scenes. It didn't right. upgrade. Yeah. And and just for to in defense of Microsoft around it, when they released that, they told everybody that that was going to be the case. That it was a temporary fix. Mm. People have been but they pushing never for meant it. it. <laughs> <laughs> they never but, meant it before. Why now? <laughs> well, well, I I put a link in the chat about the SharePoint lookbook. Have you all seen that? Yeah. I mean, I okay. So the the lookbook. I was looking at a couple solutions for a project I'm working on right now, and I download it, and they're like, install this on your site. It comes with all these web parts. And you go in there, and the the main page is a bunch of screenshots. Mm. It's like they're not the actual web parts or, they, or, or like placeholder content. Like, how is this helpful? Now I have to still build this. <laughs> and I was about ready to scrap the project site that I was creating and was going to replace it with that. I'm glad I didn't scrap it because I'm like, oh, yeah, I should have used this. And I'm like, I'm glad I didn't use this because it – there's no content in it. So yeah, That's it's funny. it's pretty, but you yeah, have to know what you have to how to build what they have. So Yeah, and I think that this is might be a little bit different because they're actually embedding this into the SharePoint online and mobile app. So it's like the the default templates you got, they're just adding to the default templates. So I'm my assumption is is since it's embedded that once those are, you know, if you upgrade, um, they'll get upgraded along with, you know, everything else. Um Obviously, I don't I don't know the specifics around it. They they're very vague about it. Um, maybe one of our SharePoint folks could find out more. Uh, or, I was just doing a search here. So yeah. this is a new announcement because I yes, have breaking news for me. I was on vacation, <laughs> so I missed it apparently. Breaking news, yes, yes it is. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna check it out. All right. So uh, moving on, we're gonna talk a little bit about Teams. Everybody loves Teams. They have uh, the organizational wide backgrounds. Now, I know we've talked about this before in one of these uh, little things that I do every every time we get together. Um, but it was, it's kind of weird that they re-announced this. They, they, they tagged it as a new announcement, but I don't think it's really new. But I think what they did was they clarified it because now they're saying in order for these organizational wide backgrounds, you know, where you assign backgrounds that the entire org has to use, um, they are requiring an advanced communications license. So in order to use the organizational wide background, you, can, you know, the only way you can is if you have an, uh, an advanced communications license. Um, so teams free, no, you can't do it. Um, you know, and some of these EDUs that don't have that license won't be able to utilize as well. I don't, I don't think that's a good thing. I think it's something that they should give to people for free. I mean, all it is, is you're just introducing a, a background that everyone is required to use. You know how how big of a deal is that? But I guess, and I looked at the the, the license, and the license is like five bucks per extra per license. And that's 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 a cost that some people just won't absorb. So, yeah. for some, that's their entire Office three sixty five subscription cost. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially for nonprofits, yeah, they don't even pay that much. That's, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It, 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 this to me is something that is just so trivial that it should not cost anything. But I don't know the reasonings why. Um, we're also going to allow anonymous presenters in team live events. Why? I have no idea. But they're going to allow uh, anonymous um, you to create a Teams live event and then say, okay, this person's going to come in as an anonymous and they'll be able to present. I, I, I don't I, understand I, that at all. Their face will be blacked out and the vocals will be all. <laughs> Has the black box just over their eyes? So yeah. You can't yeah. Out the entire face. You know, and it's I mean, just I, really. 
I understand like the, the capability of being able to um, add in people that weren't the you know, specified at the beginning uh, presenters. And if that's the intention, I don't know what other controls are in place. I mean, if I could go in, if I have a meeting and I've got, you know, Mike, you and I are presenting and we see that, hey, Hal and Sean are in there. Yeah. And be able to let's add them as presenters. Well, I get that ability. You don't have that ability now. Right. So if it's not not anonymous, like we don't know who they are, because that just makes no sense. I think it means anonymous mean not pre-established as there, a presenter. Well, and you very well may be right, Christian, but there is no defi- definition in the in the notification that this you know of this feature being rolled out right. so, so all they're saying all they're the saying, worst and and yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's very yeah. vague you know your yeah. meeting organize organize uh, organizers will now be able to schedule an anonymous presenter for a team's live meeting when using the team's desktop app uh, the anonymous presenter must also use a team's desktop app to me that's it's very vague i i, I you could be very right i don't know Anonymous meaning they don't have an account in your um, tenant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I oh, no. yeah. there's a there's a few different flavors of anonymous there depending yeah. on yeah yeah all right I, uh, I like the back stripe and the garbled voice <laughs> scenario but, <laughs> but yeah. not garbled just yeah. lower the the <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyone in witness protection could actually present a live event you would know they that's were. right that's right that's right. Um, getting back to backgrounds a little bit, uh, you can get customized backgrounds in Teams. Meeting uh, is video is coming to mobile devices. So this has been one of the most asked for things um, on the uh, roadmap for Teams is being able to add, you know, some kind of background for a mobile device because you never could do that. So now you can walk around with your with your uh, phone and be on a Teams meeting and it's going to be all, you know, whatever background you want behind you, which I think is going to be kind of weird because Depending on where you go, you know, I don't yeah. know. I, I, I'm not convinced that this is this is something that's going to, you know, play out well for some people. But, you know, we'll when see. I'm dialed in on my phone with a lower bandwidth connection, what I want to do is use up more of that bandwidth. With yeah. <laughs> yeah. Think so. yeah, really. Exactly. Um, so I don't know. I got a question for the group. Did anyone here know that OneDrive, the OneDrive application that you load um, on your desktop is, is, has always been just a 32-bit app? It's never been a 64-bit app. I did not know that. Um, so now they've actually released a 64-bit update, and uh, OneDrive will be 64-bit. Now, I, I always thought OneDrive was 64, but so that's kind of a big deal because they're talking about speed enhancements you know and everything being uh, 60 quit 64 bit native um so so be- is do we have to do something to uh move over to that version it's in preview right now so if you want to jump on it you can download it and uh install it otherwise it'll be rolling out and it'll be a a sync app update so okay. it'll automatically pull OneDrive out and then you know drop the 64 bit in well so one Chris person just I- run the 32 bit app two instances of it there, there you go. Yeah. It says twice as good. So if I Very run good. four instances, then it should yeah. just be twice as fast. No, I was just going to suggest that uh, one person who I know I saw a post out in some of the Facebook communities, Hans Brender, who's an MVP, who's kind of Mr. OneDrive. Mr. OneDrive, yeah. Um, and, and so he had an article. I didn't read it. So I, I remembered that at one point that I knew it was only 32-bit when I saw his post. Um, so I was aware of that update, but that would be a great place to go with questions. So I'll probably get back to Hans and ask if there's anything else I need to do to be prepared for to make the move over to um, 64. Because usually it's a separate application, and there's and usually with things like that, there's like no migration path. It's just a, it's a different application. Right. Do you remember at a time when Microsoft recommended that even though you were running a 64-bit uh, Windows, they recommended just using 32-bit Office app. Yeah, uh, 32-bit that? Office had a lot more features to it and things, less yeah. fewer things that were broken than the 64-bit yeah. version of Office had. Right, so then they they changed that story a little bit, right? And they started saying, oh, yeah, you can use 64-bit. It's the same as a 32-bit. Um, but that meant, you know, for specific applications, obviously, because, off of, uh, out, you know, the OneDrive stayed 32-bit. 
but like Word and Excel and PowerPoint and you know so on and so forth, all one sixty four bit. Prior but, to that, we had the thunk layer for sixteen bits, yeah, thirty two bits. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. All right. Uh, lastly, something that's in development that showed up on the roadmap, which I think is like huh, uber cool, um, and has a lot to do with authentication. So, in Azure Active Directory right now, you can do um, a uh, authentication that allows just to be IP based, right? So you can say that this user can only log in from this IP address, or this group of users can only log in from this IP range, if you will. Uh, now they're actually adding to that, and what they're doing is they're allowing for GPS. So you can say that this is in this conditional access policy, you can say this group of people or this person can only log in if they are in this GPS coordinated area. Um, so like geolocation, right? Um, they have to be they have to be physically in this branch office in order to be able to connect to Azure. OK, and that is huge when you think about it saying that, well, the only way you're going to be able to work, you know, on this project is you have to be in the office or you have to be here at this location. And that's the only way that you'll be able to connect. How are they going to implement that? Uh, they're using name location, uh, GPS. So they're actually using GPS coordinates. Um, they have to allow location services on the device you're using and it'll, you know, coordinate where you are from a GPS perspective and say, yep, yeah, they're within the parameters so they can, they can give it either allow or deny um, to, I shouldn't say to access, but to the objects or the resources. That's wild. Yeah, it is this really. It reminds I mean, me of back in my telecom days and back with Pacific Bell Wireless uh, before they rebranded to Singular. So in our office, um, they is basically you walk outside the building with your mobile, your uh, your company phone, yeah. and there was a dead spot, a ring around the building, and they did yeah. that too. That geofencing, yeah. yeah, yeah. And right now, this thing is only going to be just so everybody's, uh, I'm clear on this, is that it's only going to be available um, if you use a Microsoft Authenticator app, all right, um, and because that Microsoft Microsoft Authenticator app is going to supply that GPS information. That's in the initial deployment of this. It it is being uh, the, the plan is to upgrade that uh, in the short term uh, to be able to allow any device like a, a laptop or a desktop, anything that has location services on it. Awesome. Well, yeah. thanks, Mike. Hey, yeah, Mike, and I just thought, too, can you send me just the the, uh, uh, the each of the items that you went through and we'll include yeah. them. We'll line item them in the blog post as well. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so for anybody that's watching, of course, there's uh, you'll be able to go out uh, and we'll have the recording of this entire session out on YouTube later, and it'll be uh, in a blog post on BuckleyPlanet.com. But you know, in each of those locations, you'll be able to see an, an itemized list of every topic, every question that we cover and we answer or attempt to answer, and which is a good time for the disclaimer yeah. uh, that we attempt to answer some things. There we go. Um, that reminds yeah. me, have you, have you highlighted Joel's thing that I sent to you guys in email about the <laughs> telephony question? I saw that note, Mike. <laughs> the what? You didn't get that, Christian? What, what, what are you talking about? Mike sent I, us a I note. sent you and Sean an email. Joel, uh, is it Joel? What's his last name? Joel Olson. Olson. Uh, yeah, he is uh, writing a webinar to answer any telephony questions oh. around M365. <laughs> oh, I didn't see that. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. So okay. we thought we might promote that since we don't answer any telephony questions. We'll need to hijack. We'll need to get in there with a bunch of really messy telephony questions. So, um, but uh, yeah, no, hey, a couple of the videos that I did where I pulled in um, some of the telephony, uh, the 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 Skype uh, MVPs are some of the uh, the, the m most viewed of my uh, my video interviews. So. Yeah, you know, people. There's a there's a certain certainly a desire for answers around telephony questions. So well, I'm glad they're getting them somewhere because it ain't here. Yeah, and I and I think I kept this one telephony free. But uh, this week's uh, community questions here in episode 55, we're gonna kick things off with a Teams question from Pablo, who says I administer a 100 plus person team. Someone deleted a channel that I was lucky as able to restore. I have a setting that doesn't allow members to do that, so it must have been an owner. Uh, there are eight of those. How can I see who deleted the channel 
short of asking them all. Is there an audit log I can see? Somebody wants to invoke wrath of God. So there are in Compliance Center, I believe it has that info. I don't have it open. I put a, sure, I put a link in something. the chat. Okay. How to, how to view the audit log. Oh, then so, it got, uh, oh, I see Mike, the telephony ad as well. <laughs> the trick on the audit log is it has to be enabled first. So you can't like, oh, somebody deleted. I'm going to go turn on the audit log and then find out because it doesn't back track it's from that point forward so but at yep. least at this point it's a unified switch versus per workload i know how to turn it on and off i i defer to you showing on the technical side of that. <laughs> so thank you <laughs> i know where the on on button is that's about it yeah so that's that's one of those things and of course it's it's that capability is augmented by third-party tools that make it you know uh, easier to go in and set up and you know to turn on and off features like this but um you know so yes i mean micro if you have if you have the auditing capability if you have that turned on you should have visibility into who deleted a channel who done it, it used to be it used to be you had to turn the audit log on by powershell only i remember correctly but i'm not sure if that's still the case just to double check that in order to get the compliance reporting and that kind of thing to come through right yeah, well, assuming that if you have uh, eight admins, if you're if you're that big of an organization, hopefully you're tracking that kind of thing. If not, you need to quickly kind of uh, go in and assess your entire environment if you don't have that turned on for that large of an organization. He didn't say admins. He said owners. True. Which, you know, in SharePoint, of course, is all the difference in the world. Well, if someone has the ability to delete, it should be able to log that event and track that. Yeah, oftentimes it's auditing is your only true course of knowing who did what, yeah. especially for permissions changes. And here's an interesting thing too, just a thought. Uh, if if you're in an organization and someone's done this and the admins reached out saying who did it and nobody fesses up <laughs> and is that what's going on here and it's like i'm just gonna have to go in i'm gonna log in i'm gonna find it if it's being tracked if the auditing is turned on for the organization they're gonna know who did it why would you hide that information like look i screwed up i accidentally deleted it you know well you could fake them out like my parents used to do and say i know who did it we're just waiting for you to fess up and then <laughs> and then Playing somebody chicken. Said, yeah and see who reacts to that and then you know who did it but yeah <laughs> flinched uh yeah you've you've had children sherry <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's that's kind of the uh that's the experience that's right well, i had my my kids completely convinced i could see every text message they sent and <laughs> it's because i that i used to make them put their phones in my office at night and then i knew all their past I didn't, they didn't know but i couldn't you know see everything yep. <laughs> i did because they had to in order to charge it it had to be in my office yeah that's yeah. funny all right uh question number two joseph asks uh, we're trying to keep our critical issues at a minimum and one of them is keeping office 365 up to date most of our office updates will run perfectly fine automatically however a select few will often get stuck and we'll need an admin account to allow the update meaning we have to keep logging onto devices and updating them manually each week why do some of these updates in a small few users get stuck randomly permissions um, confused pretty much has to be permissions yeah well i'm confused i don't know exactly where <laughs> yeah because office works in the context of the user it doesn't work in the context of an administrator um everything is based off of current user so i don't i'm trying to understand why some users would get stuck and others would not it has well, nothing to do with an administrative permission well the do office updates go through the windows update service because no, that's no. got a privilege context no. okay no. no they do not they have their own channel they have their own distribution so it's that's what i'm confused about i mean i can understand that they're having problems maybe they lock down the specific users or certain users you know to a point on their machines where they can 
open up, you know, a browser. Maybe it's in kiosk mode or something like that. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, but that was my first thought is that if there's another <clears throat> profile, if they're logged in a different profile, I know but still the, the update normal, is to their profile. Yeah. It's, it's, it's based off of their user permissions when it's installed. Now, if an admin installed the office as a custom setup and <laughs> maybe had something in there that was custom created, it's possible that the user cannot update that. Because, you know, you can do a custom office setup and add your own stuff to it, obviously. So. Yeah. That sounds like the likely, likely scenario here. It's just weird that it would be some users and not all. I just, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not clear on that. I Most mean, I've had the users they don't trust and they've been, <laughs> they've had their permissions yoinked. Yeah. All right, uh, question number three. D asks, can someone tell me if there's a way to change the text size in the little dialog boxes? I'm not, not even sure ones, if I'm the using the right ones. word. I, I'm talking about the little boxes that open up when you go to the main search bar and type in something like paragraph settings. I'm visually impaired and I can't read what they say. Ease of access. Windows 10 ease of access. There's a link in the chat for it. If she's visually impaired, I I would think she probably would know about that, but. Um, there's a quick one, of course, being shortcut Sherry. A Windows Plus will, will temporarily magnify whatever's on your screen, and then you can window minus, and that will reduce it back. Um, if, you know, if you don't want the, if just one thing that you can't see at a certain time, but if visually impaired, I, I put a bunch of links for you for the different options. Or zoom it. Sys internals. Oh yeah, Zoom it's good too. I recommend for everybody, regardless of what they're doing or they need the magnifying glass, get the Sys internals tools because there's a number of very handy dandy things in there. It's a free download from Microsoft. Um, now that they acquired mm -hmm. it from Mark well, Sinovich. Yeah, you don't even have to, uh, and and Bruce too. Uh, but you don't even have to download it. You can run it online now. You can run oh, any right. of the cisternals online. So. Yeah, but I threw a link in the the chat. So. Yeah, no, that's cool. I will pull that. So these are these when these. See, I just learned something. There are these Windows toys. Like I found the color picker, and I'm very excited about that. Uh, the power toy. <clears throat> power that's a power, power toy. toy. Yeah, the that's power toys. Than, yeah, that's different than cisternals. Okay. Um, cisternals is actually a whole bunch of utilities. You know, it's more around functional utilities. And there's a couple, I guess, you know, like BG, BG Info BG and stuff Info. like that would be considered, mm -hmm. you know, kind of toyish, but they're, they're really utilities. Yeah, oh. for, you know, detecting process problems, yeah. memory issues. Auto runs. Tracing. Uh, I use auto, auto runs. Auto runs is a good one, yeah. Uh, as well as permissions. If you've got a very difficult granular permission problem, you can, you yep. know, watch the, the various requests and where ACLs, they seem to yep. fail. Yep. I've seen presenters use Zoom it. I, it's, I didn't know where it came from. I, yep. I think you can download it, but. They're invaluable, yeah. Very yeah, process, process Explorer is my tool of choice as a PFE all the time. Yep. <laughs> all right, question number four. Uh, Shalendra says, is there any way to restore deleted SharePoint 2013 designer workflows? <laughs> the first, thing, the first yeah. thing you should notice is that it says designer 2013. SharePoint 2013. What yes. year is it? It's 2021. <laughs> it's a very old <laughs> product. Well, it's a valid question in one respect, though. Um, invalid because of the supportability but and if it doesn't work you're not going to get it and the key thing with sharepoint 2013 designer workflows is did you save it as a template before you published it if you did you can re republish the template now the question is you probably can't pull back the state of any existing workflows that were in flight when you deleted it but you could certainly get the workflow process back but you must have packaged it as a template in order to do that if you didn't you're done or if you've got a, a backup tool that happens to grab the workflows, yeah. those are always kind of dark art things, but those are the other way, potentially. 
Yeah, because it's um, yeah. If you had, uh, well, I guess, yeah, it's the scope of the backup, whether it included whatever that is, where that is, and how recently it was deleted. When I worked at Idera, um, the initial backup application for SharePoint that they wrote did a custom object model walk, and they would pull as much as they could, but they they didn't get 100% coverage because the workflows are uh, the workflow ex exposure is very hit or miss. So you could get ZOML, but not instance data and all kinds of stuff like that. All right, jumping over to question number five from Josh. Mm -hmm. I have a document library with roughly 100 documents, each representing an employee record. I would like to know what is the most efficient way to apply item level permissions to these 100 documents so that, and Sean, you're like, the, you're, we're getting answers <laughs> out of the facial. <laughs> I'm like, even before we get there, says, well, let me finish the question. It says, apply uh, it, it, the most efficient way to apply item level permissions to these 100 documents so that each employee only sees their file, but without having to manually apply permissions to each document. So we get a variation <laughs> of this kind of question like every single week. Take a breath, Sean. Take a breath. Write a flow or power automate. I mean, if you want to do it automated, you know, you're going to need to run it in the context of a an admin or a privileged user, but you know, they could assign the uh, look at who the employee is, assuming you've got a consistent way to look them up and you know, set permissions that way. But uh, per item permissions, 100 documents isn't nearly as bad as it could be. If you were saying, you know, 5,000, 100,000 documents and you want item level permissions on them, I'd say there's got to be a better, more performant way to do that. But So you can build a script. I mean, you can have a power app, you know, so basically script it for as part of your new employee onboarding process that it goes through a number of steps and assigns unique permissions to this this doc as it's created or creates the doc on the fly you complete it it's through a form dumps the information into that that doc and applies the permissions I there's an interesting one because all, all along that path there's various points in time at which you, you, you upload the document then you set the permission there's a short period of time at which that document's going to be open and inherit from the document library. Now, I'm not saying anyone's going to be specifically hunting for those documents or even going to be quick enough to find it, but it's not 100% full. But what if someone else builds a flow on there that's running and looking for or a power app that's looking for documents with inherited permissions? Just takes one someone a bit rogue. It almost seems to me like the, the permissions need to be somehow applied to the document before it moves like you know what was the what was the um when we used to have the concept of the um document center where you would mm. upload a document to like a holding folder and no one else could see it except the system and then the system would look at the metadata on the document and apply specific rules and then transfer it to the right location if you want to be super secure or i say super secure want to be a little bit more hardy then that's probably a way to do it but i think as long as Christian, I think your 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 description works perfectly well. As long as you've not got something else in there that's able to scan that, but, you know, on upload, run X flow or something it could, be, it could be an issue. What was that old thing? Was it the drop off library that did that? That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. drop off drop library. Off library. Yeah. Now it's With the it, is it content rules. organizer now. Content organizer. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. I created an entire documentation solution around that and yep. all the metadata it was... i did that for a client as well yep and and it was uh, cool I actually created a desktop icon and they would just drag docs and literally just drop them into that folder and they would get processed to some so, degree so did it's... that solve your insomnia sherry <laughs> no <laughs> Because stuff would get stuck in limbo because they would drag and drop and they wouldn't fill out the required properties <laughs> and they'd be stuck. And then and then I left that organization because I was a contractor. And of course, my account was the one that got the notifications and things were stuck in the <laughs> in the queue. 
And I went back about four months later, and there was like ten thousand notifications. Of <laughs> I'm like, somebody needed to be looking at this account, you guys. <laughs> So, yeah, I just could. remembered, you know, back when I used to do the, uh, you know, like 20 uh, uh, SharePoint features um, you should should know or you should you probably should be using, but don't or something like that. I had a variation of that presentation, which I ha I've had. It's funny out, out in my uploads in um, uh, SlideShare, uh, I, I've had probably half a million views of just that that deck and the, the several different versions of it. But yeah, the old drop-off libraries and the solution that I built around that, that was part of that. So that's going back 2010, 2011, 2012. Yeah, these were 2010. It was a 2010 environment. Yeah. Um, yep. Fun stuff. Pretty cool. All right. <laughs> Question number six, Dallas asks, is it possible to embed report graphs from Dynamics 365 into a SharePoint online page? You can put anything on a page with a web address. Yeah, but are those transportable? Um, can can you consume them that way, or do you have to? I mean, is there a way to dynamically add those, share those from Dynamics 365, or are you just grabbing images? No hablo Dynamics 365. <laughs> I, I second that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, Dynamics it, is the new telephony. I think the technical uh, term for that is. Uh, yeah. Uh -uh. <laughs> yeah. Disclaimer. So gonna, disclaimer. We're have to hunt on <laughs> yeah, that one. Yeah. Quick oh yeah. I'm disclaimer. Sorry. That, that's right. Let me let me cue the disclaimer here. <laughs> sorry, Dallas. <laughs> of the uh, of what year the quality of the guidance that we're providing occasionally. Mm. All right. Question number seven, Andy. I'm trying to create a sort of virtual inventory of around 100 applications. That's that 100 number. We're just rounding everything to 100 today. Mm. Uh, a sort of vir virtual inventory of around 100 application forms with links directly to the different companies' PDF of the form application online. I was wondering, is there at all a, a, a possible to set up wait, a- wait, wait, wait. Stop, stop, stop. Oh. Emphasis now. Is there at all? At all. <laughs> <laughs> possible to set up a hyperlink email to to with the PDF of whichever form on the cell. Uh, the PDF will also be a hyperlink before the email. Uh, this was, by the way, this question, as you can't tell, um, I think it was uh, 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 translated. So I don't know what the original language was. That's why it's a little bit odd in the wording here. I'm currently experimenting with several programs, and so far I've I've already a list of all the forms already created. I know I can create the list of links that go to the app, but I would rather have a list of links where I can simply click email and it gets attached to emails. Email templates with one attached to each one. That'd be tedious to create with a hundred of them, though. Yes, it would, but it would work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could be a power app. Well, I did yeah. something I did something similar with a SharePoint workflow and I put like the the preceding content for the link and then a unique identifier um for a page it was it was to filter for a page in SharePoint. So whenever they would add a record, I had a page that was filtered by that. And I don't know if you could do that, create a little um um calculated field that has it already in there i don't know interest like i don't know probably yeah. not probably not because it would have to attach it to an email right yeah i don't know any way to to correlate between each of the different documents to each of the different companies you'd have to manually go and set that up one time the first time right. set that up and then you'd have that automated link, but there's not an automated way to go and do that a hundred times. Mail, mail merge. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. hey, hi, can we have can we have one big shrug emoji like? Yeah. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. okay. All right, only, sorry. Only if we can capture you doing it, Mike, and then that <laughs> will be the. Yeah. I know. We'll just, that's, that's what we're missing here is we're, we need to pull more memes of us like <laughs> <laughs> text. Above <laughs> people, so. 
Do that again, Some, Chris. I'll screenshot you. <laughs> uh, All right, there we go. That's good. Okay. Sorry, Andy. Um, jumping to question number eight with Harry. I'm going to be an admin of five Office 365 tenants. So right now, if we could all um, take off our hats and um, lower the flag to half staff yes. <laughs> uh, for Harry, I'm so sorry. That means five logins, et cetera, et cetera. What is an easy way, an easy way to administer these tenants in Windows 10 using five edge profiles or five virtual desktops? Or is there an application to do that more easily? There's an application to do that more easily. And it's built right into the admin center now. So they actually have multi-tenant administration capability built right into admin center. So you no longer have to do anything outside of, of that. You can easily switch between tenants just by clicking up in the corner and selecting your tenant name. And then you can flip back up between all of the tenants that you you manage that you are a a global administrator or the or the uh, um, admin administrator too. Does it work well? Because I know in other like profile switching scenarios, I, it doesn't it doesn't <clears throat> seem to stick. I, it keeps reverting back. I don't know. Well, in the admin center, I've done it. Um, I have three tenants that I manage, and I can I, I haven't had no problems with it. Um, but I think it also uses the same basis that uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Azure Lighthouse. Um, it uses the same type of technology that Lighthouse uses um, to switch between tenants. So it's a little bit different than like profiles, you know, anything like that. It's it's actually, you know, switching directly to the tenant context. So. And that's with three different accounts, Mike, or one you, account? No. Well, you log in once and then you have access to whatever tenants that you can uh, administer just by hitting a drop down uh, in the upper left hand corner. So does it log you out and log you back in? There's a new account or does it or is it a single login that is like a guest admin? Not can be a guest admin, but like a. Um, for me, like, for me, like a super account that that. Yeah, see, I have the same I have the same account, so I don't know because I use I use a control account. I use um, the dot on Microsoft uh, dot com with the company name in, for my three tenants, and I have the same login for all three tenants. So that's a good question. I don't know if you have different logins. Maybe maybe there is a problem with that. I don't know. Yeah, I know my McDonough online account, my Bitstream Foundry account, my I've got a bunch of different. I'm still Sean at that organization, but they're all entirely different accounts and I've got to log out and in. Oh, yeah. mine, I, I just flipped through them because I use this. Like I said, I use the same account for all of them. So and that makes sense to me. The log in, log out, you'd have to. Yeah, I, I don't know. I I created I finally gave up on it, trying to recognize how I was logged in and I created different profiles on my computer and I log out. As one user, I log in as the other user and then let it cache. Because then I tried to use Chrome and I was getting like my C drive was was full. I'm like, I don't keep anything on my C drive. And I realized all these Chrome profiles, profiles. <laughs> were bloating up my hard drive. So that was a new yeah. discovery a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah, don't go crazy with those either, apparently. <laughs> my Plex server just chews up system drive space with all the stuff it throws into a profile. It's ridiculous. It. Yeah. yeah, it's like uh, it's just a login. They're just like passwords. It shouldn't be that hard, but yeah. So I'm I'm intrigued though, Sean, for one little thing. I don't, I don't want to drag this one out, but if you let's say you're logging in with, you know, Sean at Contoso on Microsoft dot com, right? Mm -hmm. For want of a better name, how can you have that Contoso domain registered with three different tenants? I can have yeah. that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was just, uh, you could be added as a guest. Correct. In those tenants. Yeah. But well, can a guest be an admin? Yes. Yes. Okay. It can be. All right. That makes sense. Then. Sorry. Because that's what I, that's what I am. Is I have my on Microsoft.com account for all three tenants. And I am a guest in two of those tenants. And I am an admin, uh, a global admin in those two. As a right. guest. That, that makes that makes, that makes more sense. I wasn't aware you could promote a guest to a global admin. Yeah, I don't think you've always. Well, I don't think you've always been able to do that. Yeah, but they did add that. 
Yeah, maybe there's a component of making this feature work. I guess it must have been. It had to have been. Yeah, but it's still not as seamless as I think everyone would like it to be. It is right. a bit of a hassle to log in and out uh, in instances where you need to do that. All right, question number nine. Murray asks, uh, I have come across an issue whereby site admin with full control that have synced to their local drive are not able to edit files, whether they are checked out or not. It seems to be similar, uh, similar to the forum post, provides a link to that, that link there. I have read through the issue and other sites, but not yet been able to establish how to resolve this issue. Is it a checkbox that is missed when syncing to the local drive, or is it a permission state that needs to be changed, or is it simply that site admin should not sync to their local drive? Don't everybody speak up at once. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, all, all I can think of is, you know, when you try to save to a local and it says you don't have a permission to, you know, save here when you try and save to the desktop, I, wherever they're syncing to, like, it must be blocking them from being able to save that to that local drive folder. I don't know. I wasn't going to say anything, but y'all were quiet. So I thought, well, I'll throw this out there and see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, I've had my own issues with file sync. And again, uh, you know, like four or five different accounts that I actively have running with different OneDrive storage. And I've, you know, it's it's not as simple as just being able to go to a location because there's synchronization, synchronization uh, with online and then there's the, um, the local cache and copies live in various different places. Um, and when you use it with SharePoint, for instance, that that local working area is slightly different. So I I do not feel qualified to even comment on this. I mean, I, I've had a similar issue where like the sync was still active. It was like underway. And so it would limit my ability to go in and, and edit. I could read, but I couldn't edit because the, the, the sync was underway or or something i don't know it was just you know went back a couple hours later and had no problem getting to those files so well, i wonder if they use the you know right click on it say always keep on this device maybe it's sitting in the uh on the files on demand and it's that they didn't get demanded yet i don't know well to work with it locally you would have to even if it's just in the cache um yeah, if they're I've using noticed. the desktop client. Right, yeah. So I go to the C user profile, OneDrive, go to that, that root folder, and then try and right click and say, always keep on this device. And maybe that'll um, push it, nudge a little bit. <laughs> Good morning. It's Monday, give me coffee. <laughs> 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 I don't know. All seems right. like it seems like a this kind of day. <laughs> yep. I don't know. Yeah. Christian setting us up for failure with these questions. <laughs> That's a, it's like a, 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 it's now I just think back again. Rackley's comment about uh, it's like, what is what's the deal with these questions? I'm like, uh, I know Mark prefers the softballs, but, you know, <laughs> hey, these are uh, these are uh, for, for folks that are watching this, the, the recording of the live stream, too, is that these are raw questions that we're pulling we're not i'm not uh doing spelling correct on anything i'm not changing the grammar of anything i'm cutting and pasting these from a number of different facebook community pages from uh and there's actually seven or eight that are from uh microsoft tech community unanswered questions as well so these are uh, that's the point is they used to do this at, at live events we used to do the uh you know what the, the stump the experts we were chumps. Stump the chump. <laughs> Stump, Stump the chump. Stump the chumps. Yep. Uh, let's see. All right. Question 10. Tom. Yeah, I'm just, uh, do you see how smoothly I just moved on from Murray's <laughs> question there? Um, question yes. 10. Tom right. says, uh, current setup is we have a Teams channel, <laughs> including the channel calendar tab. 
meaning any event put in that calendar will be sent to every member of the channel. Nice and easy. The problem is now that we're starting to have more in-person meetings and other kinds of external meetings, such as Zoom calls, the platform of which we shall not speak, <laughs> that everyone in the channel needs to be invited to. By default, creating an event that calendar sends out an associated link for a Teams call, which adds some confusion when we're not actually intending to have a Teams call for that meeting. Is there a way of not sending out Teams call info for meetings created within the Teams app? And in particular, for a specific channel, I suppose a workaround could be to create the meeting in the group calendar on Outlook and then inviting the group, but then you can't be channel specific. Any help would be appreciated. Yeah, that's an interesting dilemma. So my, because that's my first response. If you don't, if you want to just do a meeting invite and not have them, then send it via Outlook. Yes. But the problem is then you can't dedicate that to a specific channel and discussion and all the activity. It's an interesting edge case. <laughs> like, how would you go about uh, solving this? I mean, any other ideas? Well, meeting in a channel is is a passive meeting anyway. Uh, you know, it just shows up. It doesn't actively invite people, and they don't have to RSVP. If you send it through Outlook, it's there. I don't know. Mm. That's that's the only way is to send it through Outlook and put the actual link in there and not put it in the channel. Um, I don't know. Why would you create it? Why would you create a calendar in Teams and then not use Teams for the meeting? That's what I think is weird. You know. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of implicit. <laughs> yeah. So, my opinion. Well, if that's the place, yeah, I, I think maybe that's part of the interpretation of the question. If they're using that channel calendar as the way to manage all the activities and they want it visible within that calendar, that's why they're using Teams to create all of those meetings. But it's it's linked to if it's linked to a group, you should be able to create it in the uh, the, the the group calendar. The problem is then it's not channel specific. So there's a way of you know getting it to all the right people, but it's just it's not the way that they work. Basically, what they're asking for, I think, is to Sean, your point is this edge case scenario where I create a meeting within Teams, um, but I don't I'm able to remove the online portion of that. I mean, my only other thought would be to put in the headline, put in the description of the meeting invite like no team meeting or no online meeting, you know, and just make it kind of the protocol of the company. When you see this, you know, then that means that there's no team meeting. It's just. So Teams is hosting a party and it's not welcome at its own party. <laughs> Correct. But then it would show up in the right calendar. All the members of the channel would see it and you'd have that benefit. If you're talking about a small subset of meetings, the majority of them are Teams meetings, then having that, it's, it's like it's like your naming convention um, for, you know, where, where you add in the, uh, you know, a prefix or a suffix so that you have a standardized way of naming files. It'd be the same thing for, for meetings and just come up with a prefix for those that are created within Teams but not online meetings. Yeah, well, on channel meetings, you can't have external people, so maybe they're wanting other people outside included too. I don't know. I don't know. I I, I read it as the core issue is managing centrally in that channel calendar, yeah. and that would be a the quickest and easiest workaround for that is add a prefix to the description. Yeah, I don't know if someone mentioned this. I got a bit distracted for a minute, but um, and I don't think this is even possible, but it just might be a nice idea for a, for a request. Imagine if you could use a channel calendar as like an old school exchange resource and invite the channel calendar to a meeting. 
that you set up via a different different channel, via a different process, maybe maybe through Outlook, like we used to do back in the day, right? Or invite meeting room, invite XYZ, whatever it might be. Invite the printer to the meeting. Thought, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because then it would show up, assuming it would auto invite, auto accept, given it's given the chat. Well, I guess it wouldn't be busy, but because um, it's just a calendar. But it might be an interesting thought. I just thought. Interesting. I have an interesting thought every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> Very if few of them are related to IT. <laughs> if you're allowed to share. Yeah. But no, no, I, you just had Neil here for his good looks. <laughs> I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's, oh, I was just going to add in. So we, we you know, a couple comments over on uh, Facebook, the live stream. So Keith Ritchie had been making some comments uh, about Fab 40 and said, die, Fab 40, die as one of his. <laughs> yeah, and I just like it. And Paul, Paul Swider just jumped in and, and he says, uh, we need Fab 40 for Power Apps portals now. And then he put in ducking, you know, ducking. <laughs> <laughs> I love Paul. Like asking, for asking, for asking for a friend. That's right. Asking for a friend. I had somebody make a reference to Clippy. You know, the 540 and Clippy are kind of in that same <laughs> purgatory. I think there's more love for Clippy. Gone but not forgotten. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's jump to question number 11. Tony asks, uh, anybody have any idea what is going on in the outlook for Android mobile? Since the last, oh, hey, it's a telephony question, sort of. Uh, since the last few updates, a whole bunch of accounts don't sync, no notifications, and random emails don't load in. Uh, has anyone else seen that? Or is, is that, that accounts across a single device? Or is that accounts across multiple devices? I don't know that it's systemic, Tony. Um, Make yeah. sure you've got lots of room on your phone. Outlook for both Android and iOS are a bit of a memory, are a bit of memory logs. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you can go in and look and see if there's been any, um, well, no, I mean. I think this is more of a user specific problem than a, a global yeah, Android I mean, well, Outlook problem. The only yeah. thing I've ever had to do on my mobile devices, you know, I'll change my, uh, account password and I'll have to go in and you know resupply credentials but you know that's a one-time thing and the only other question is have they updated it recently you know the the app might be out of date mm. and causing an issue yes it's always possible that you know like you say Jerry you know we, we possible you ship a bug right in, in Outlook for Android so how many people are affected by this maybe mm. there's been a patch recently I don't know. That's probably stretching it. I don't use an Android, so I don't well, I it, test mm -hmm. it. I haven't well, heard I've, any reports of anything, so. Yeah, and, and I, I update my there's apps. some feedback somewhere. Mm -hmm. I update my apps periodically, and, and some people don't. They don't know that you have to, sometimes you have to go in there and actually say, oh, there's 46 updates, please. Yes, thank you so much, though. <laughs> They just oh, install no, and forget. For <laughs> they set and forget. They, it's like, oh no. 46 updates. updates. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I, May I have another? <laughs> <laughs> I was, Thank you, sir. May I have another? <laughs> well, I had a Windows phone and I always said I loved my Windows phone. I still love my Windows phone, but Agreed. the app stopped working, right? And before that, I was like, all I needed was trip it, you know, my Outlook. That you know, I'm not an app junkie, but then I got an Android. Now I'm an app junkie. Like it's ridiculous, all the apps that are out there. Just yeah. to order food. Yeah. <laughs> Chick fil A, Panera Bread. Yeah, I'll, sorry, I didn't, didn't, I didn't. didn't BK, McDonald's. I mean, <laughs> you name it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I used the Whataburger app yeah. last night. <laughs> My so husband. Brought in che cheese and broccoli soup from Panera Bread. It's fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> we just went through the airport in Houston. My husband's never had a Whataburger. Like oh, and and I said, honey, this is like the In-N-Out Burger of Texas. You got it. If we're here, you got to have a water burger. <laughs> he liked it, so I'm getting yeah. hungry. It's my last time. <laughs> yeah, let's just... it's getting. Can we stop talking about food? <laughs> I didn't have breakfast. Now I'm just thinking. Yeah, I'm just if we're talking burger places, you know. So there's 
two that I highly recommend. I mean, one, I'm a huge fan is since I was a kid out of LA, um, Tommy's Burger. And there's a little Tommy's Burger stand uh, down in Provo, just south of here. And so every time I go down to visit my son who lives down there and I will uh, force him to go get the uh, the double chili cheeseburger. Oh, twist my arm, I know. It's rough. <laughs> uh, wow. It's fantastic. But then I'm a, I'm a uh, Carl's Jr. double Western bacon cheeseburger guy. It's like the uh, it's like eating Wonder Bread, you know, version of hamburgers. And it's just so unhealthy, but so delicious. <laughs> I like this six dollar burger. Yeah, my favorite there was it. the really big Carl. Yeah. <laughs> the six dollar burger with their bread and butter pickles. We're torturing Sean on purpose now. So. <laughs> my mouth is watering here. Like, so good. I'm a burger. I'm a burger guy, so I just I just love that. Yeah. <laughs> they opened an in and out here and every the yeah, line yeah, yeah. is like people are waiting two hours. I'm yeah. like, I'm sorry. There's no reason for there, to wait two hours for a cheeseburger. You know, like and it, I love my In-N-Out. I do, I, but not two hours worth. <laughs> no, they're good. They're fresh. They're not the best burger, but they're they're tasty. They're and again, it's just fresh tasting. Hate the fries. Absolutely hate the fries. Really? Fries. Shakes are good. Like, hate the fries. No, oh don't like God. them. Got to do them. You got to do them animal style. Well, animal you do them animal fries. style. Plus, you do them dark. And what they do oh, dark well. is they they overcook them. When they're dark, oh, when I need dark. that. Oh, that that's what okay. I'm missing. I didn't realize that. Okay, that's that's off. That's one of the off the menus. You gotta you gotta okay. Google off the menu or the, the, the hidden the menu. Secret menu, yeah. Up. Yeah. Okay. Are there any Fud and, Rockers and, left around? Fud Rockers. And the Neapolitan. I used to love shake. that place, Sean. I ate burgers back then. Yeah, they were really good. <laughs> but they disappeared <laughs> from around here. I don't know. Fud Rockers. Well, Five Guys kind of replaced. I know it's different, but it, nobody it's, uh, replaced Fud Rockers. Five guys, you can't get some pink in the middle. We did a ten yeah, minute has squirrel great moment on cheeseburgers. Yeah. How did how did we get in the topic of hamburgers here? I blame Sean. My, it's my fault. I was talking He's about Ash. I still, guy I still blame Sean. You to stop. <laughs> okay, let's uh, jump to question number twelve. <laughs> Focus, um, people. Theo asks, does anyone have a method for forcing a SharePoint list to alphabetize by a certain column? I've done the A to the Z sort in SharePoint, but as I add new list items, the sort doesn't automatically hold. Also, I want the sort to appear similarly in Teams. Is there a potential JSON-based solution? You don't sort the list, you might sort a view, first of all. Yeah. And then that's specific to the view, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, as you add it in, I mean, you're going to view it. It's off to view. The default view. Yeah, you might have to refresh the window refresh. if you're on that view. Just hit refresh. Yeah. F, F5 is the shortcut. Yeah. Um, and see if it fixes it. Otherwise, it's adding it to the end, right? So. Are we missing something else of, of his request? Because that's the <laughs> first thought. Yeah. That's no, a pretty it's basic it's, thing. It's, what, yeah. he's, it's, he's basically column sorting in the list view that he has. And that column sorting only applies to that initial mm -hmm. first time you click it. Hey, we answered a question. Yes. <laughs> yes. The thing is, I, I don't know if it appears the same in Teams because I've got two SharePoint. I've got a SharePoint. And I go to my Teams channel SharePoint list, the view. I don't know what, the, what views Teams use. Shooter McGavin. Yeah. Hey, it grab, should use the default. default view, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. default view. I, thought, I think it should. It should fix the but isn't, it, isn't that relatively new that it can support the other SharePoint views, though, now? That's a query string parameter. If you want a different view, so I think it's just Teams though in the Teams client. I believe in the Teams client. If you click on Files, in the Teams client in the channel, you can. Well, maybe you can. Maybe there's maybe there's a channel setting to choose the view. Mm. I, it's been a while. Yeah, That's you'd in, be I think sticking it some way to it. Yeah. That's in that super secret Microsoft Teams application that Neil uses. It has all the special features that regular people don't have. That's right. We're not a high enough rank some, in the Masons yet for that. Some of them, some of them you don't want. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I did put a link in the chat for how to create views. So if that helps whomever so, didn't know they could. It's always helpful. It's, that's Good common. Yeah. So, so Theo, yeah, look at modifying the default view based on Sherry's response. Sherry's response, sorry. Yeah. So, the, so the question that stands is whether it will stick inside of Teams. How te does Teams 
treated differently or is this new uh, ability is it there so i'm going to take it as homework because so i read about it i saw something i can't i couldn't find it just did a quick search i'll go and track that down in teams though you have the views in the upper right hand corner so you can change your view but i think it's grabbing the default view by yeah. by default by default because because yeah. <laughs> that's default it's it's just so <laughs> random that they would name the default view and Defaults then that would the what would show view. up that would have default i know <laughs> department of redundancy department. crazy right. <laughs> uh, all right let's see question 13 hillet says uh hello i'm building a sharepoint site mike this question's for you so listen in. i'm sorry i'm <laughs> sleeping to the sharepoint question in the site in the site, there's a document library that contains different procedures. I would like to know if there's an option for every user that reads a procedure to mark that he was reading it. I thought to open a private list for every user that there he could mark all the procedures he was reading. Every record there will be re related to a procedure from the library of the procedures. Is this possible? How can I open a private list for every user? I'm trying to figure out his business challenge here. Like, is the fact that he wants people to acknowledge they've read it, or is that they're they've checked it out and they're reading it? Like um, a learning system almost. Sounds like more of a workflow process than yeah. a SharePoint yeah. process. Yeah. The only thing is, they could the SharePoint um, review workflow is what comes to mind, so that and assign it to every person, and then that would keep track in the workflow of who had actually done that. Uh, Mike or Sean, I'm seeing you nod at my idea. So I'm like, I mean, that's, that's one way to sign. skin it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there. Because, you know, for uh, SOPs, I've worked with many organizations before who just wanted to ensure that uh, a document was reviewed by somebody. And so they would want to track it that way uh, for compliance purposes. Um, so something like, uh, you know, Power Automate or SharePoint Workflow or something, you know, just the approval workflow, like you said, Sherry, would work as well. I hadn't considered that, but that's an interesting way to skin it where you would probably have very little extra work if you build a, a group with everybody in it and simply assign it to them. Yeah. Let SharePoint do the heavy lifting. Yeah, I don't. Do they have the review workflow in in modern now or no? You they deprecated the 2010 workflows, right? They deprecated 2010. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, eleven years later, so eleven years ago. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah 2010. I'm totally. over it. <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah. 2010's off now. So. It's not an approval workflow. It was just like a review. So people had to review and say they, you know, and acknowledge they reviewed it. Yeah, it had um, its origins actually in uh, um, WSS. It wasn't even a SharePoint workflow. It was a, you know, th you had the three state kind of thing that you could set. It was real low level. Well, let's jump to question number 14. Alma says, is there a way to get a combined report for unique visitors of SharePoint Online sites and Microsoft Teams? How do you get metrics of total SPO usage and MS Teams? Neil's got oh. the answer. There you go, Neil. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you got volunt voluntold. That was funny. Since his like, hotel internet kicks me out every 90 minutes. Oh, so, well, that's, that was weird. I'm not, I'm not really sure yeah. if, if in the Microsoft M365 Admin Center, if they have reports for SVO. I don't you think they, from a reporting aspect, I'm going into the Admin Center now. And I mean, it's usually just around compliance and security. Um, so I don't think there's any native way to do SharePoint it. SharePoint unless... reporting's always been pretty crappy. Yeah. Well, what you could do is, I mean, and I've done this, I've done this for clients, is take the, you know, you can you can export the raw data and bring it into Power BI. And you know, create your stuff there. Yeah. I mean, Power BI has the, the connector to pull that information. So it's it's easy to do. I'm in there right now and I can see that I can separate out SharePoint. Um, and Teams data 
um, for the you know for uh, active users, um, activations, files stored, you know all that kind of stuff. Um, but I mean, if you want something that's more custom when you're talking around metrics of total SharePoint usage in MS Teams, uh, is it you know combined report for unique visitors? You're not going to get that from a from you know the the the, the canned reports they they, they give you. Plenty um, of third party tools, but yeah, there yep, are plenty. Of, yeah, yeah, I've seen it yep. in Tigraph, so yeah, you know this exact thing, but but I, yeah. I mean, like I said, I've taken it, I've taken it and just did the Power BI connector right to 365 and be able to pull the data and do whatever you want with it. Right. Yeah. Yep. All the activity reports, dedupe it, then you'd have your unique users in that given yep. time. So, yep. All right. Question 15, Puneet. Is there a way to convert CSV to Excel in order to consume the file in Azure Data Factory? Uh, Is this a trick CSV. question? Yeah. Open the CSV file in Excel, save it as an XLS. Yep. I've done that before. Surely we're missing something. We are definitely yeah. missing also, something. Also, ADF should be able to pull in CSV direct anyway. Cut out the middleman, sure. Couldn't I create a power app that would? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah. yeah, but what does it yeah. sort by? Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah. So, yeah, so that's pretty easy problem to solve. Unless there's some other detail. That's worked out. <clears throat> but that, that's the question as posted. I have a hard time believing nobody else actually tried to answer that question. Unanswered question, Microsoft team, uh, Microsoft tech community. Jeez, That's wow. Weird. Maybe they thought it was a joke. I, yeah. <laughs> or you know, don't want to get punked. I don't know. Yeah. Question 16 from Christopher. Uh, running into an issue. Uh, so very... Uh, so very orderly in his uh, question here. Setting, so it's a document library with incoming email settings turned on. The problem, how to extract a particular string from the body of an email, or how to extract the body of the email so that I can target that string. He's using SharePoint Designer 2013 on SharePoint 2016, have access to SharePoint 2010 and 2013 workflows and no third-party apps. Does designer support regular expressions in some form? Because regex would be the thing to get at that most directly, I'm thinking, if there is any kind of variations. But I don't know if uh, there's any step in uh, designer in the workflows that supports regex. No clue. Hey, by the way, Sorry, Keith just mentioned too. 2010 ends today. Is support ending today? Is it the April 12th? All existing instances explode. <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> I would. I would actually, you know, pay to to watch that on a live stream. Yeah, really, Mike. Get your popcorn and just. Yep. April 13th. It says April 13th, 2021. Oh, okay, yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Keith corrected himself as well. Yeah, because it wouldn't be good to end on a nice round number, the 13th. That just, that number just <laughs> feels right. But but it is Tuesday, Microsoft it's true. Tech Tuesday, right? So. Yep, correct. <laughs> uh, yeah, so any other thoughts on this question? Yeah, it's an interesting one. So he's saying how to extract a particular string from the body of an email. Is he looking for the same string from every email that's going into the document library to make sure it's present? Or is he looking for a different string each time? Yes. Because he... <laughs> one of those things, probably. <laughs> yeah, definitely because, one. Be because you can use, you could potentially, if you just want to find, does this item contain or do items in this library contain this particular string why not just use library search turns what he wants to do with it afterwards because library search will tell him all the documents all the emails 
in the list that contain that particular string. Yeah, so it comes down to what does he mean when he wants to, what's the use for extracting? Yeah. Yeah. Another one of those examples of uh, being able to ask follow-up questions, oh. clarify, <laughs> so nice. Yeah. And there's, if you imagine this scenario, and this is, imagine if you're, okay, this, this might get a little bit questionable. <laughs> Just mute me if it does. <laughs> It could be somebody looking for social security numbers, someone looking for credit card numbers, with emails <laughs> that have come in, people, re people responding to them nefarious emails. You know, your Nigerian uncles left you $10 million, but at least some of your bank details. I'm pretty sure it's not. Christopher, that's no disrespect. I'm pretty sure it's not that. I'm sure there's a genuine business case here, but we just can't really yeah. eke out what the what the business case actually is. You know, I've said this before, I'll say it again. When the Crown Prince of Nigeria reaches out to you personally for help, <laughs> you help. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. It's only five thousand dollars that he just needs temporarily to help him out of this jam. And then <laughs> you get ten million dollars. I mean, who would not go for that? All right. Uh, question number 17, uh, and how are we on time? Well, we got a few minutes. Uh, Ian says, is it possible to block guest access in Teams and through SharePoint permissions only allow guest access for a single team for a small number of guest users? I'm not hopeful. That's a great way to, to round out the question. <laughs> that really makes it easier to respond, you know, because we could just kind of like, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. it's already All hope is lost. <laughs> Ian wasn't hopeful in the first place for any guidance or help. So block guest access in teams through SharePoint permissions. Well, number one, you shouldn't be messing with teams, especially not teams channels by modifying SharePoint permissions at the back end. That's not a good plan. Sometimes it might seem like the only plan, but it's not a good plan. Only allow access for guest access for a single team. Mm. It's all or nothing, isn't it? I yeah, think it doesn't it go is. that granular. It's, yeah. Yeah. Unless they had a separate tenant where they allowed, um, like a federated tenant that they would allow external access to. I know a lot of organizations do that. They don't want them in their real environment. They create like a .NET. So the .com kind of entity, show that one. Almost like an old school DMZ. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, I mean, if you have external access set up, and but just tightly control teams that can enable that uh, as part of your provisioning process, for example, and then, you know, enable a team with, you know, external users, that are possible. And if you want to further limit, then create a private channel within that externally ac accessible team, because only is the limitation. It'd be great if you had a you know private channel that you could invite external people that don't have access to everything else, but you have to have access to the team to get access to the private channel. Yeah, it would be good to have that the other way around, so you could have that scenario, you know, private versus kind of um, Almost like public only. The shared channels resolve that. So I know I don't know what's been talked about publicly and what's the capability, but you know, isn't doesn't that resolve that? If I have a shared channel, I don't think that with the shared channel, um, I think the thinking is again, it's not it's not out there yet. It's just being talked about whether the current thinking is that it's. Uh, you can have, you know, external people that aren't members of the team. I mean, that's that's the idea. You want to be able to share it and communicate with people and other tenants. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, don't know. Boy, we are we are so helpful today. So we are. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to. I'm trying to think if any. If, is there any kind of conditional access policy that supports, you know, only um, like FTs versus guests? I don't know. Teams has a few of them, but I don't know whether they 
have that scenario. Might be worth a look. Well, if your users are defined, if your users and guests are defined outside of, I mean, in Azure, Azure Active Directory, which they have to be um, as part of 365, then you should be able to assign them separately in any app that uses Azure Active Directory. So what Neil is saying, yes, that definitely should be possible because AAD is the backbone of ever all the authentication for M365. So. Yeah, I'm just looking at it all to Shari's point earlier. Um, I can see AD premium licenses as a scenario under Matt Salzman's blog that talks about how to apply conditional access policies via Azure AD for Teams, but it's an all or nothing scenario. You either have access to Teams or you don't. You might have, you might need a Azure a, a AAD P2 to do that as well. A P1 subscription may not do it. <clears throat> Well, I think we can squeeze in one last question here. Maybe we can provide some help here. Question number 18, Jesper. OMG, anyone here who are able to give some advice that is useful? Well, that, that begs He has question, our number. Right? <laughs> Post the disclaimer. Post the disclaimer. Uh, it says, the issue, I had a free subscription in which I created a VM. I then had to change my security info to my mail and wasn't able to log into the Azure portal for 30 days. Contacted Microsoft, no luck getting around the 30 days cool off. Anyhow, the 30 days cool down have finished, but my free subscription has expired now. I can't transfer the resources because this subscription is disabled. Anyone who knows what to do, there are files I need to get from this VM. I was told by Microsoft that I could get access to my VM up until the 28th of April, which obviously wasn't true. Okay, so a couple things going on here, right? Um, try and unpack this. Uh, first of off is that just by changing your email, okay, that is assigned to the free subscription account, you you would absolutely be able to change that with Microsoft support. Um, I've done it before several times. It does require um, a long authentication process to verify you are who you are. OK, um, but they will do that. And uh, so I'm not really sure what steps were taken to get that. Obviously didn't go transfer. through the support first, went and made the changes through whatever online right. the automated capability. But even if you did it after the fact, support can then authentic, uh, you know, take the steps to authenticate you, um, which I've actually had to provide a driver's license at, at one point just to say I am who I am and then they were able, they they switched the account and I was able to access the account after that. So I don't know how far they took it. You know, if they they yeah. said, hey, you know, I got to get to you know whatever. The second part is, is that there's an automatic 30 day recycle bin on every resource, right? And so you have 30 days after the fact. Now, if you were matching up the free subscription time to the 30 day recycle on the VM, that should have probably told you that you're not going to make it in time once you're the the cool off period. Um, happens now. I don't understand. I mean, I've heard of this cool off period. I've never experienced this cool off period. Um, but I've always just had the account changed. Okay, so I'm not really familiar with that. Um, but I, I just I, I can't understand. Even though it's a free subscription, it's you can you can tell Microsoft and prove to Microsoft you are who you are. They're not going to not allow you to get at whatever you created up in Azure unless they say you cannot tell us for sure that you are who you are. So we can't give you access to somebody else's stuff. Mm -hmm. I can get, I get that. But um, they, you know, the, the thing that comes back to is about the free sub. Any free sub that's been disabled past the trial, okay? They're talking about a trial sub because you can get a free sub that lasts forever. You can create a VM and free subscriptions don't die, okay? They don't die anymore. It's not a timeout period anymore, okay? So that and that went into effect. Yeah, that was back in early 2020 where they changed it, where free subs last forever. You can always create certain things in free subscriptions. Um, but the thing I, I'm still not clarified on is that Microsoft or they should have researched it a bit and found out that you can take a free sub, switch it to pay as you go 
and all of your your stuff just magically comes back to you. I mean, everything that you created in the free sub will come back, even if it's up to the 30 day recycle time. So if you tell them that you have this subscription ID, you want to convert it to pay as you go, then they will do that. You give them a credit card and you can get your information off the VM and then you can cancel the pay as you go subscription. So they still have the ability to do that. They probably still have the ability to do that is to open a support case with Microsoft, give them this, the subscription ID and say that they want to convert it to a pay as you go. And Microsoft looks that up to see if the data is still available. If it is, they convert it. User gets their data off. User cancels the pay as you go. All right. I, well, I'm, thank you. Know. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, we're we're at time. Thanks for that uh, that yeah. detailed answer, Mike. And uh, thanks everybody else on the panel for joining today, and those that uh, watch in the live stream or on the recording. Again, we're, we'll be back next uh, next week. Uh, some of us will. Some of us are bailing again, Neil. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> but um, he's down in Cancun, so it's understandable. Yeah. Um, but we'll be back every Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific. And again, this episode 55, it'll be up on YouTube in the next day, uh, as well as at buckleyplanet.com. You can find all of our past recordings there as well. And every one of those blog posts have you know every question that we've answered, we've responded to. I, sometimes I tweet out like individual responses with links back, but so you don't have to wade through all 90 minutes of the recording. You can actually jump right to the topic that is of interest, or you can listen to the entire thing and get all that that fascinating talk about hamburgers. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Just good stuff. I know. Yeah, Just, it's the hamburger edition. <laughs> well thanks a lot everybody we'll see you guys next week all right thank you have a great week everyone Bye.